Continuing on with our Olympic series and talking to those who were involved and brought home gold for their countries and in their various classes, we have on the line Dylan Fletcher, arguably the most exciting finish of the entire Olympic Games. It came down to inches. Dylan, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. Just uh, It's just slowly sinking in, I think. <laughs> Still sinking in. My goodness. Well, uh, first, firstly, congratulations. Secondly, thank you on behalf of the entire global sailing community for the cardio workout that was watching the 49er medal race. <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. Yeah, it was cool. It was, um, it was quite, I guess, it was a bit more stressful and close, you know, the regatta than we wanted, but it was... Uh, it also felt good for sailing the sport to showcase it and that we do have exciting races and there is a lot on the line at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything's on the line. It's the Olympics. It's what it's all about. And that race really just, I think it, it will go down in the ages. I know that we're going to be talking about that 49er medal race for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So amazing. <laughs> yeah thanks yeah it was good yeah, yeah. i think if, we, if i go again i'll try and although make it less exciting yeah <laughs> <laughs> we don't want excitement as sailors but as spectators uh, yeah. thank you so much <laughs> but we'll come back to a bit more at the games but before we do that i kind of just wanted to walk through how you got to where you were i mean what what was the drive behind becoming a, an olympian essentially so Let's let's step it back all the way back to where you started sailing and, and if you can remember the moment when you decided that you wanted to try and win a gold medal. Yeah, initially when I was a kid, all I wanted to do was be a Formula One driver. Wow. Um, yeah, but I mean that was like that's like seriously expensive and all sorts of things. And um, I remember we moved we moved from London up to the Midlands and. Um, I did a bit of acting work, I say acting, I did a bit of work when I was a kid, like three or four years old and got paid some money on to be on a few TV shows. And oh, so wow. mum and dad said, yeah, when I moved up, I was like 11 years old, we moved and they were like, oh, you can have a quad bike or a boat. I was like, well, I want a quad bike. <laughs> and then mum was like, well, you can't have a quad bike. <laughs> <laughs> so and I got a sailing boat and um, yeah, that's sort of where it started, just reaching up and down the, a little pond in the Midlands until I was 13 when I started racing. Yeah, fantastic. So, so then you started racing and this is always an interesting crossover too when sailors change from being a sailor to a racer. Uh, but it sounds like you always had a bit of the racing in you if you loved F1. Yeah, I was always, I've always been quite competitive and uh, although initially when I started sailing, yeah, I just loved hanging out with my mates, you know, yeah, and just especially in summer, you know, but then I got into racing and I uh, sailed a, a quite a quirky boat um, called a Hobie 405, which probably hardly anyone would have, would have heard of. We only got four or five boats at a regatta and if we were lucky, we'd have 15 at the Nationals. Mm. I did that for a couple of years. It's like a double hander, um, sort of like a probably cross between, is it like a flying ant and a 29er? I guess that's a good way of explaining it. Um, sure. And and then, yeah, got into a 29er when I was 16 and just, it seemed to, sort of, that was when I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to go Olympic sailing. But obviously having not been in RWA squads and starting relatively late, I had a, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we always all have a lot to learn. It's just the rate of learning and, and how high we set the goals. So when when did you go, all right, 49ers, that's what I'm doing. That's where I'm going. Let's give it a whack. Yeah, we were, we were in um, 2005. I was in San Francisco for the 29er World Championships. It was the first time I'd ever been outside of Europe for a regatta. And um, we went there. And I was, it was my first, it was my, like, it was my second ever sort of full year competing at like that level. And we were winning the world halfway through. And then it got a little bit windier and we started, right, and I remember um, Ewan McNichol was there sailing with Jackie Bonichka and yep. they just 
hammered the gold fleet. It was like big afternoon breeze in the bay, 20, 25 knots. And um, I remember coming away from that and just thinking, right, I've got to get better. I want to sail a 49er. I want to go to the Olympics. And um, and it was then the following year when we were in Weymouth at, our, at the World Championships combined with the 49er Europeans and seeing, you know, the likes of Draper and Hiscox and Stevie and Ben in the 49er that really inspired me, you know, to be like, well, this is where I sail and this is, this is, this is a thing, you know. So that just really sort of pushed me to... Yeah, just go, right, this is what I'm doing. And unfortunately, school work sort of had a little downer at that point. As it does. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but here I am today. So it all worked out, luckily. It all did work out. And so talk to me a little bit about uh, the partnership with Stu, I mean, and your Olympic history when you first got to go to the Olympics and then, and then how you came to be sailing with Stu, who's also won a silver medal in London in the 470, for those who don't know. So he's uh, now got a silver and a gold. Yeah, so we were, I mean, it all started, you know, like for that 2012 cycle and I was, we were really, I said with Alan Sign and we were really green and young and keen, you know, and we had a lot of, we had a lot of good results in progression, but ultimately when it came to the trials, we, we weren't really quite good enough or ready enough at that age. Um, and that was probably disappointing. The event before the Olympics in the venue in Weymouth, we medalled at beating, mm. you know, beating the Kiwis, beating um, Stevie and Ben and everyone. But unfortunately, through the trials, we weren't quite there. And then uh, the 2016 cycle didn't really go to plan. We had lots of ups and downs and had some, you know, really a, a very long trials against Stuart and... Uh, and Pinky and again we didn't quite and almost arguably we weren't actually almost in as quite as good as position as 2012 we didn't quite get it all together we had some big issues with sort of equipment and um and Alan obviously decided to stop Olympic sailing and I think it was the right time for us to to, to go our separate ways and then that's when Stu started and we were just hanging out in Weymouth chilling sailing our moths it was like oh, what are you doing for the next four years he's like Nothing it was like, do you fancy uh, going 49ing? Nice. That was it. <laughs> and then you were hooked. So, so off you went. And then, uh, I, I mean, matching up with somebody who's medaled before, is the pressure more, less? I mean, how did you feel matching up with him or was it irrelevant? Talk to me about that, that first time that you sort of formulated that team. I thought it was quite important for me that Stu has been to the Olympics and uh, I think especially medalled uh, in that, you know, when you go to your first Olympics, no matter what you say, there is something about it being your first Olympics, whereas once you've been once, there's, you know, you're only going back for one reason and that's to medal. So, and he'd obviously already medalled, which really put that gold medal at the forefront of the programme. And so when we started sailing together, I guess it was all, you know, it was all fairly relaxed. We hadn't committed too much. And we went to Miami beginning of 2017. We'd done, I don't know, a few days training beforehand. And then we went and won with the medal race to spare. And, and neither of us had done that before. And that was like a bit of an eye opener that we were still, we had a lot of areas that weren't very like good and polished and we struggled with, but actually the sort of overall dynamic between the two of us was, was amazing. Was working, yeah. So then, so from there, you've, you've started formulating that team. And that was a really interesting point that you said as well. You know, he's, here he is winning silver with, yeah, with patience there, there. Yeah, having a, having a good old time. And winning silver is brilliant, but winning gold is even better. And do you think that was maybe a, a big driver for your campaign that you were so focused on, on going one better on what he'd already achieved? We certainly um, put, you know, when we, when we were doing our planning for the whole campaign, we had, you know, gold was in the center of it. It wasn't medal, it was gold. And, you know, it's hard to, it is hard to sometimes make those decisions around you know, do you push certain things 
to you know ensure that you just meta like you can be a bit more conservative or with certain things or do you really want to push for that gold and and ultimately i actually think quite a few boats in the 49er class have made a lot of some big gains you know the germans and spanish as well and so i'm really glad that we put that in the center and our whole campaign was completely different to how we'd campaigned before with some of the equipment side you know just like working out which builder we wanted to use and when we were going to select our masts and all of that sort of thing and although it all got completely turned on its head when covid came around the corner and our boats got sent early and our masts we hadn't used our games masts for like basically 18 months before the olympics which was a bit of a shocker but um but it turned out all right yeah i mean it's really interesting actually because essentially everybody had to start again um not only was your target moving because you'd set yourselves up to peak for 2020 then basically that target was moving how did you cope with that uh i mean i think it was different for everybody but obviously with that gold mm. medal at the center of your focus you had to make different sacrifices yeah we spent um Compared to the other European countries, I think we spent a lot more time in the UK mm. uh, or like in our home country. And we only went abroad like half, once COVID hit and lockdown, we only went abroad for about uh, 14 days in the rest of 2012. And, you know, we were obviously a little bit nervous at times seeing all the other European teams training together. And, um, you know, we seem to have some fairly big lockdowns, it felt like in the UK where we couldn't sail for three months and that sort of thing. But, you know, we, we, we like most people, I'm sure you grabbed the opportunities you had. We went and got really fit during the lockdown period when we couldn't sail. We worked hard to help the rest of the British boats and train them up and be really open to get them better to then help us. Mm. And, you know, we just sort of, decided to open a few more boxes or doors in our campaign that you necessarily wouldn't have had time to work on and put more emphasis on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess that that's a thing too, is being open and training up the others, but now going into the next potentially shortest quad of your life, from the longest quad to the <laughs> shortest quad, off we go. Now you might have a bit of competition on your hands in the 49er. Yeah, you know, um, Stu's, Stu's more likely to stop. So, mm. and we've got James and Finn coming back, who obviously pushed us hard during trials in last cycle. Mm -hmm. And then there's also new masts and new sails. But the new masts and sails is something that I, um, is almost one of the reasons why I'd like to carry on. It's, you know, exciting. There's a new challenge and that's, that's sort of one of our skill sets I feel is good at. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, no idea how it's going to work with squads and openness and not or whatever. But at the moment, just uh, just I'm just not thinking about that. I'm just going to focus on the moth world. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. That is a good idea indeed. So I think maybe at this point, uh, what we'll do is have a listen to you crossing the line. We're going to talk a bit more about the medal race now, uh, <laughs> and and just what nice. what what we're down. So. While I'm getting the audio ready, do you want to set the scene for me and talk to me about the points and how tight it was going into this medal race between not only the three that ended up on the podium, but I mean, I think there were five of you that were a chance of having yeah. a medal at the start of that race. Yeah, I guess so. It was a unique, well, for, unique for me, medal race heading into the Olympics, like that last one. It was, what did we have? We had five boats really capable of meddling. Um, we were four points off uh, Pete and Blair and we were equal points with the Spanish. I mean, it was just hectically tight. And to be honest, um, we were super excited to be in that position, but something that we worked on and feel that it's like, it's what we thrive in. We thrive when that pressure's on and you've got to go and deliver. So yeah, I mean, it was definitely not the plan because the original plan was metal race of spare but it became obvious it almost became obvious during the week that that wasn't going to be a thing so just focus on getting to the metal race in you know good shape absolutely and actually i'm going to go back one step further if it's okay with you uh, talking about having that metal race to spare 
you are one of very few teams out of 10 classes when you look back through the results yourself and Stu are one of few teams that were on top of the start and the finish of the regatta in every other fleet there was a massive turnaround in the results or at least a shift from first and through the through the podium so do you think that goal of winning with a race to spare helped set you up for that or did you just cope with those shifty conditions on day one very well I think we just sort of dealt with every day as best we could and we were trying to you know manage I mean it was a tricky week as you saw for everyone and we just um we tried to deliver just we actually changed fairly quickly into just trying to deliver top three days we're like if we just every day we have a top three day we're going to be where we want to be and fine like someone might get slightly better but the points, you know, whether or not, yeah, fine, the Kiwis were four points go ahead of us going to medal race, but you can think of 20 decisions where that, where we would have been four points better off, and I'm sure they would have been another four points better off. So it was just one of those weeks where you had to, you had to just keep fighting for every point, every place, and just keep your head up. And I think that that's why some people, I think, like, struggled because if you just had to, it was hard to know what was working. It was patchy, there was bubbles of tide, and ultimately you just had to keep fighting, keep looking, and stick to your guns. Mm. And so there's five teams going into that race who can medal. The defending gold champions, Peter Burling and Blair Chuk, who have also just won two America's Cups in a row together with Emirates Team New Zealand. They're at the the pinnacle of the sport are in front of you. You go into that medal race and you know that pretty much coming down that last run, and you'll know because you have those numbers in your head, exactly where you need to finish. Talk me through that last run into the finish and then we're going to have a listen to the, the call of it. But, I mean, what? Yeah, I mean, we always knew, we always knew it was going to be, like when we were in a medal race and it was that close with, Pete and Blair, um, you know, we, we've, we, you know the track record of the other boats, you know their traits and what they're like, and we knew that they'd, they'd be hunting us a bit before the start and they were going to, you know, they were going to have a good race, they were going to deliver, that's what they're good at. So, to be honest, that's, that made it quite easy for us as a girl, we were like, we just need to go out there and target a top three run with Mike Browning and try and win the race and, you know, just make their life harder if we can. And, Going down that last run, we talked about the points. We said at Wimbledon, at Wimbledon Mark, right, the only thing that matters is beating the Germans. Nothing else matters. Yeah. And um, I think that's what all we were just thinking about down the run is, you know, what are opportunities here? Keep the boat going fast. Stay calm. Don't get, you know, locked up with it. And, um, you know, and Stu was really good, you know, at sailing the boat. I think you can hear it on the comms how we were relatively calm and it was like quite normal in our boat. So... And even coming right into that little finish, we weren't, you know, hyper. It was all super chill. Just get that boat, get on that wave, get it over and get the job done. Get the job done. Not the first time I've heard this heard this saying in this series, and I'm only talking to you as the first athlete. Ah. I've spoken to a few coaches. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. This could all come down to this final job. Can they hold their nerve coming into the finish here? Great Britain in first, Germany in second. This is all about the gold medal, ladies and gentlemen. Port and starboard coming into the finish. Who is going to get it? I think it was Great Britain, but let's stand by for the official results. We can see celebrations on board with the Great British Fair. Fletcher and Biffle take the win in the 49er men's medal race. Germany cross in second, and the New Zealanders cross in third. Oh my goodness, that was literally down to the wire. We are waiting for the official results, but as far as I can see, <laughs> that means that the great British team and the New Zealand pair, the defending Olympic champs, finish on equal points, which equal means point. that the gold medal provisionally <laughs> would go to Dylan Fletcher and Stuart Bithell. Oh, and a fantastic race by the Germans. What a race. And then <laughs> we got a bit of man love. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that just showed, you know, all the years of, you know, hard work. It's, it's not just this five years that we've done. It's all the years beforehand. And, um, yeah, I think it always, you know, you get it's always more emotional when you have a tight finish like that as well. 
Oh, for sure. Because then it's almost in your mouth feeling that medal and, and hats right. off to Peter Burling and, and Blair Chuk. They did a great job of defending that medal when they'd had so much other stuff on their plates, but great sports too, to just be like, you know, came down to that finish and, and, and you got them good and proper, but uh, a team effort here too. I think your coach is on the floor here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's struggling. <laughs> Cracker uh, ben shot. was amazing, you know. Yeah. It was an easy task throughout, you know, the, the quad with um, with James and Finn in such a close boat. And, you know, it wasn't easy. We all had our difficulties. But when it came down to the last year and, and especially at the games, you know, he was just really nice and consistent, delivered everything we want. And, uh, yeah, it's great to bring that um, gold medal and have him involved and just for the rest of the GB because we'd won silver and bronze up to that point and been quite, you know, the Aussies have been dominant, the Kiwis and we, the Brits have won a, a lot of worlds. So to do this really topped it off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I just loved it too. Uh, then the victory lap past the wall and <laughs> basically in my mind, I'm like, don't break your mask, don't break your mask, don't break your mask. We've already seen that with the FX. Uh, <laughs> so that was all a, good, a bit of good fun, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we were, it was a bit disappointing. We wanted to go and, you know, capsize or whatever, but uh, they were like, you have to capsize in this area. And we were sort of, we were like, we can't capsize there. And we were paranoid about doing anything wrong that might make one point of scoring penalty difference and take away. So we were like, we have to do everything, pos you know, <laughs> by the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is which, which was a very different story uh, compared to Martin uh, Grail and Kahita Kun, who, who were just before you and came from a similar position to also win gold, but broke their mast <laughs> on, the, on the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Whoops. big celebrations. I mean. And then, of course, stepping up on the podium, I mean, has it, has it actually sunk in yet? I mean, such, a, such an amazing yeah, achievement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just sort of occasionally you're just sitting there and you're like, oh, we won gold, that's pretty sick. And you just like, and you just get that feeling in your stomach again, you know, and it's just, uh, yeah, it is unbelievable. Yeah, and if, if there's one thing, I, I mean, it's pretty hard to pinpoint one thing, but what was it you think that got you two up onto that dais? If you could pinpoint it on one thing. I think it's, i uh, probably just put it down to the, the belief and teamwork we had. You know, I think you see it in, you know, you saw it in Nathan Goobs and you see it in Pete and Blair, you know, they have great strong teams and um, they have a lot of belief and that's, that's, that's what we had ultimately. And, it just gets you through the difficult times and it means that you just always have that trust between the two of you. Yeah, and the belief maybe having that gold medal at the centre was a, a big winner there. So I have to say congratulations. I was, again, I was so excited for you and Stu. It was such a finish and you raced beautifully from start to finish throughout that series. So I guess everyone will want to know what's next. Do you want to go to an Olympics again? Obviously the moth worlds. I mean, that's what every sailor does <laughs> in your position. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's only three years, which doesn't sound, I mean, it is long, but it doesn't sound too long. So I think, um, yeah, I think I'm keen to give it another shot and, you know, but try and still explore, you know, other horizons. We obviously we were in sail GP that got, cut short and you know that wasn't through our own doing we we both both of us would love to get back on board an f50 or get involved with ben's america's cup team but you know those are ultimately out of our control so yeah. um i think olympic sailing is great you have that complete control over your campaign and it's all about just winning so for me that's that's what i really enjoy mm. And so perhaps doing the moth will be fun. Is Stu going to come race you again, given that that's where your campaign started? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Stu's um, racing a double-hander called a Merlin Rocket uh, at the moment. He is winning. It's, I think he's got, today might be the last day, so it's a big day. And then, um, yeah, he's, we're all, at, all heading out to Garda together. Stu's been great for me in the moth because he's quite a lot heavier than me and pretty much quicker as soon as we're foiling. So it keeps me on my toes and make sure that I can at least tack and jive try better than him. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good start. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. 
Any any passing words before I let you go? Because I know you've got a big day of moss training ahead of you. I know um, Charlotte has, has made you a coffee this morning as well. So it was a tough Olympics for everyone supporting one another and, um, and being on the water at, at the same time must have been tough, but you must be incredibly proud. Yeah, no, super proud. We got we're getting married in a week. Woohoo! So in between my first yet. So that's exciting. And uh, yeah, just a big shout out to everyone that has helped us over the years and um yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> yep, you will be back with a vengeance and, and advanced congratulations to yourself and to Charlotte. And, um, and thanks so much for that medal race again and, uh, and, the, and the slight heart attacks. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic, uh, not only for you and Stu and for the Great Britain team, I know, but for everybody who's had a tough year, I think the Olympics was an amazing contribution to hope and inspiration. So thank you for your part in that and for your sacrifices to make that happen. And congratulations. Thank you very much.